Hargreaves Lansdowne hit the stock market crash of 1987 when it was only a year old, and boy, hasn't that scaled up from there. So now's the time with money so cheap to dust off that business plan and pitch stake and go forth to the scary investor community. Is now the time to go and get the money you need to scale up? Or should you hunker down and get through whatever is around the corner with your own means? There are a few things at play here. I'm seeing companies become leaner and perhaps stronger as they understand the stress points of their business. I'm also seeing faster decision making within businesses as one thing that the pandemic has taught us is that things can change rapidly, but also that people can adapt overnight when they need to. But I'm also seeing a shift in policy and sentiment, a clearer need to focus innovation on societal need. Nesta produced a report last month on innovation post lockdown and uh, the Bay's Secretary of State, Alok Sharma, recently published the UK R&D roadmap and both support that change. I think this is all really exciting. For me, that's the good stuff, as it will never to be lead to more sustainable business. But will the investor community adapt to that? Will investor decision making speed up to match the changing environment? And is there really the market for investment right now? Is that the bad or even the ugly? Whatever you predict for the future, you're considering raising investment, you want to give it your best shot. So I'm delighted to be hosting this webinar to help you do just that. We're going to be hearing from the experts this afternoon to help give you some pointers and insights around intellectual property, term sheets, and the investment process, and then a fundraising story from a real life entrepreneur. We'll hear short presentations from each of our speakers, maximum 10 minutes each, and then there'll be time for Q&A at the end. So please get those questions down as they pop into your head onto the Q&A channel uh, on your screen. And at the end, I'll pick out the questions that I, that I can. Um, if I don't get to answer your question, you can follow up direct with any of the speakers. Their details will be shared at the end. I've known Icon Corporate Finance for many years, and they know this business inside out. And I'm also really pleased to have two colleagues from Burgess Salmon, a firm that took my business through the listing process back in the 90s. There's no need, you see, to go to London anymore. We've got all the expert, we, expertise we need here in Bristol. You'll have seen the bios of our speakers and they will follow in quick succession. And I'll be back in 40 minutes or so to moderate some questions. So first off, the starting blocks is um, uh, I should have introduced myself, shouldn't I? Um, but first off, the starting blocks is Monica Simmons from Icon Corporate Finance. Over to you, Monica. Mute, Monica. Thanks for the introduction, Nick. Um, I think it's fitting, actually, that we be on this, this podcast, um, this webinar, because our roots at ICON are right here in the Southwest. We were founded in 1999 by Alan Bristow, and we've grown from what was then a TMT type business into a tech business. So our clients cover everything from FinTech, health tech, cyber, IoT, enterprise software, basically anything that has a, a tech enabled business element to it, we, we cover it. And um, you know, if you're looking to get capital for the growth of your company, or you're looking to sell your business, then basically ICON is people to speak to. Over a series of two events, right, over the series, we will be discussing fundraising. This one, uh, the, what we're talking about right now, is covering the preparation for a uh, capital raise. And the next one we'll be doing on the 23rd of September is talking about pitching to the various investors. Because obviously, with the different types of investors, you have to pitch and speak their language in different ways. Um, so do tune in for that one when you, you know, next, uh, next month. In terms of the, the current uh, presentation that we're talking about today, just kind of go to that slide. Here, today we're going to be talking about preparation for funding. I'll be covering the items that are here on the left, which is basically the three teams, which is the three T's, which are team tech and timing. I'll touch on valuation, advisors, target investor groups, and of course, just managing the business. You have to run the business at all times. The slide that we have is this overview of the fundraise process. There's a few things that I really want to highlight for you to, you know, so you guys can just really focus on them. The first is that it takes five to six months to complete a raise. And that's five or six months from when you engage an advisor. 
And as we go through this preparation discussion, you'll see there's a few things that you need to do even before that. So it takes quite a bit of time. So don't start thinking about capital raise or going to speak to an advisor about fundraising when you're running out of a runway, right? Think about how much money you have available, how long you'll need, um, you know, how long you need funding for, and whether now's the best time for you to start speaking to an advisor. We always ask people to come to speak to us much longer than five to six months before, even up to a year, just to discuss all the things that they need to do in preparation. Because as you'll see, there's things that you want to think about before you go out to market. And it's really important to have some of these things down, nailed down before you start actually the process. It gets, we, we often meet uh, entrepreneurs who are quite ready to, you know, just kind of hit the ground running when you, they haven't really prepared, or they're not as prepared as they could be. And basically it ends up taking the process a little bit longer because then, you know, they don't have the, the, the data room ready. They're not, they haven't really given that much thought to what documents they need to have ready. So really think about timing in terms of how long it'll take for you to do that. I think it's worth also talking about how um, we have different types of companies on the call. We have people that you know do B2C businesses, B2B or B2B to C, right? Different types of businesses, and we have businesses at different stages. So whether you're an early stage looking for funding, you know, at that pre-revenue stage, or maybe you are expanding, looking for growth capital to expand into new markets or to just, you know, you know, expand your your client base, you, you might be on this call. So I'm going to try and and cover, you know, a range that involves everyone. But obviously, if you want that kind of personal feedback for your investor for your company, either send a question through the Q and A at the end of the, of the webinar or send me an email, and then we can talk about your company specifically and what that raise should look like. One of the other things that I thought I should highlight at this point is around, you know, again, the non-documents when it comes to preparation. You know, when we think about preparation, you think about, you know, getting your forecast right. You want to have a forecast out for the next three to five years, so that when you speak to investors, they have an idea of what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, we think about the investor deck. Everybody knows you need to have that investor deck no more than about 20, 25 slides because investors don't have that much time. So you want to get their attention and kind of highlight all the key themes that need to come out from that deck relatively early. Um, and of course, there's that one page teaser that we talk about, which is an exec summary, which is our primary document when we speak to investors, because again, they want to just see all the key information and the key points and highlights on that first slide. And so, when, you know, people think about documents when they think about preparation. What people don't think about is how they're going to answer questions like when you, you sit with an investor and they ask you questions about traction. You know, how are you tracking to plan? What were your numbers last month? Are you on track to meet your 2020 revenue figures or are you on track for your 2021, you know, depending on the timing of when your raise is? Are you able to answer those questions? And so you really want to have a think about, you know, are you in the right position? Do you have the right documents? And are you really prepared mentally and your team, are you really prepared for that, that process of, of capital raising. And you know, like I said, it takes five to six months. So you wanna make sure that you are still running the business. At the bottom here, you'll see running the business is highlighted because it's really important that throughout this process, you are delivering on your numbers, running the business, and you can answer questions about things that are ongoing. Um, I'm sure you can tell that this is really involving. It takes a lot of time. So do you have, is the management team kind of prepared for that? Are they ready to, to, you know, to, to approach the process and handle the business at the same time. You want to give these things a lot of thought before you get in there, right? So really getting into some of the, the key points around the process. Um, you know, three T's are really important. I mean, I talk a lot about the team because ultimately investors invest in the team. And the strongest team delivers the strongest results. And so people, investors really care about the team. And that's everything from, are you from that sector? Is that how you identify this opportunity? Or are you a customer who identified um, you know, a problem with the, with the process and think that you can do something better? Or are you a PhD student who's done a thesis on this and you kind of come to life? Um, have you run a business before? Do you have that kind of experience? It doesn't have to have been a successful business, but at least you know how to operate a business and investors know that you can handle the responsibility of running a business. Um, and then also your advisor team, your team of advisors, that, that really matters as well. Are they well known in the sector? Are they advising you about you know, your sector really well? What do they bring in terms of value to the leadership team? All these things really matter. On the tech side, is it really innovative? Is it really disruptive? Are you, are you able to defend your business? Why, why, would, why should investors invest in you as opposed to somebody else? 
is, is, a, is an incumbent more likely to succeed in bringing that offering to the market compared to you or not? Do you have paying customers? Um, there's a little bit right now around really hot sectors. So if you're in if you're in AI, machine learning, IoT, there's certain sectors which is really hot sectors that people really want to get into. Are you in one of those? Um, that matters as well. And then on, t on timing, um, it says here timing is everything. I I'm an accountant, so I still believe that uh, preparation is everything, but timing really does matter. It does. Uh, and so you want to think about, again, some of these sectors that are really hot, in which case, you know, you want to just get in at that time and it's a really good time. Or circumstances can kind of just be working in your favor. Brexit has really focused the government on supporting businesses that help the UK to be able to deliver on some of the offerings that, you know, may, might have been um, from, from Europe and they want to really develop those locally. So are you in one of those sectors? That's, that's great timing for you. And even with COVID really wreaking havoc on social life, um, if you're in e-commerce, that's an excellent opportunity for you. And then, you know, with investors, um, like everybody else, they weren't able to kind of operate at the beginning of the pandemic. And so they've lost a quarter of their deployment time. And so they have all this money that they need to get out um, within the next, let's say, the, rem the remainder of the year. And, you know, if you're a company that's raising capital right now, it's a great opportunity for you. So timing does matter. It really does matter. Um, it would be really bad if I did not talk about um, data room. I'm, I'm just going to skip the advisor for a minute, but just the data room. It's never too soon to start your data room. We encounter a lot of entrepreneurs who just kind of leave this as, you know, oh, it's an admin task. I'll get to it at some point. But actually, it's really important to get started as soon as possible on that data room. You want to make sure that you've got, all, you've got someone who is whose task with pulling together the documents that are necessary for when you get to the point where you're doing a DD. Um, and you don't want to be slowed down. You don't want that, you know, five to six month process to be even longer because you don't have the materials that you need. If you're working with an investor, then we will provide you with a list of documents that we think you should have in there. But, you know, this, you know, um, information about what should be on, the, on the, um, the data room is kind of widely available. So I don't think you have a problem pulling that together. Um, looking at the advisors, that's everything from M&A advisors like us, corporate advisors like Icon, that's legal advisors like Burgess Salmon and tax advisors and other people like that. Um, I think it's worth talking about this because um, one of the things that people often approach me about when they're talk thinking about a raise is whether they should actually have Icon as an advisor and whether it's appropriate. You know, they, they just assume that they need an advisor, but it's just not always that simple. What you tend to find is the early, relatively early stage companies are looking for funding which is likely to come from high net worth, angels, um, SEIS backed investors. Those investors are less likely to want to pay investor fees, I mean advisor fees, because our advisor fees are paid out of funds raised. If, however, your company is a little bit more established, then chances are you're looking at investment from institutional money. And institutional money, I mean VCs, corporate VCs, VCT, private equity, those um, investors are expecting to see an advisor and there's an understanding that the funds raised will include the fees for the advisor so you know you can be too early you know you can you will hear feedback like you, the raise is not large enough or you're too early to speak to an advisor so again just be just be a little bit conscious about that um back on valuation i think it's really important to just point this out because you know i could do a one hour webinar on, on valuation alone but i only have 10 minutes so i'm gonna have to keep it brief the, the most important point when it comes to valuation is manage your expectations it's really important to say that and the market determines the valuation of your business not you in many circumstances we speak to entrepreneurs who talk about how a company similar to them a friend's company something that they're aware of was valued at x and so they think they're x plus or x or just a little sh a shade under but that's really not how it works because valuation, honestly, it, it, it really depends. If you came to Icon and asked us to do a valuation on your company, um, we would present you with a range. And that's kind of acknowledging that there are various valuation methodologies and there are ver various investors and acquirers who would value you in a different way. So just manage your expectations when it comes to valuation. And as a rule of thumb, you'll find that when you speak to investors, depending on which ones they are, especially institutional investors, whatever amount you raise, they're thinking that that amounts to 20, 25, 30% of your business, irrespective of whether that's three or a five million raise. So really have a think about that and make sure you have those discussions with your advisors around valuation. It's, it's really quite important. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is just around the target investor groups. Again, we will talk a lot more about that on the next webinar where we discuss the different types of, of uh, investors and how you should be speaking their language. So you can't take the one deck and have the same pitch and speak to all the different types of investors. You have to you know, really think about how you can tailor it for each of the different um, investors. 
That's one thing. And then the next thing is it, it matters who it is that you are speaking to, as in the type of investors, how you speak to those investors, as in the, you know, the, the strategy that you use to approach the investors, and when to speak to them. Because you don't want to approach your best fit investor first, because throughout the process, you're going to you know, really perfect the way you give your pitch, and you're really going to perfect the way that you, you speak to the investors. So you want to target your best investor maybe a little bit later on in the process. I'm really conscious of me running out of time. So on this slide here, which is the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'll just touch really quickly on saying, you know, we've talked about the good, which is to say that there's a lot of funds out there that are available, right? Because just the timing is good. Uh, the bad, which is well, not really the bad, but just, you know, really be aware that the process is taking much longer, primarily because some of it is now virtual, partly because of COVID, but also because there's just a greater emphasis on um, reviewing the fundamentals of the business. And the ugly, which is, is there really an impact on valuation? Big question mark, we're still in this. And syndicated rounds, which is to say, investors are less likely to go in alone. They will probably go in in partnership with other investors, okay? Which just makes term sheets a little bit more complicated. So anyway, I'll hand over now to Sarah and um, she'll speak a little bit more on IP. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. And um, hello everyone. So I'm Sarah Kenshaw. I'm a director in the tech and communications practice at Burgess Salmon. Um, Burgess Salmon is probably everyone knows, but it's a, it's a leading law firm in the southwest um, and best in practice expertise in highly regulated sectors such as um, financial services, transport, telecoms, and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the good, the bad, and the ugly in your IP, getting it ready for an investment round. So um, one of the things I find when I've sat alongside corporate um, in meetings with early stage companies who are looking for um, investment, um, well, ask them, so, so what are your assets? What, what are your IP assets? And they will say sometimes, we have none. We have no IP. Which, to which I respond, well, you definitely do. Um, even if you just have a trademark. And I'll say, no, no, we don't have a trademark. We haven't got anything registered. Yes, but you still have a brand. Oh, yes. And of course, a brand is protected. It's intellectual property and it's protected by the, the laws of passing off, in fact. And so you probably have more than you realize um, in your company. So we're going to look at how we identify all your IP assets. And bearing in mind what Monica said about data rooms and being early with your data room, one of the sections in the data room will, of course, be intellectual property and commercial agreements. And some commercial agreements, of course, will be relevant to your intellectual property as well. So it's building up those sections of your data room and making sure that when the investors start looking at it, they don't start raising questions and you so don't, at that stage, realize, oh, we don't even own this. Um, so that's what these slides are going to hopefully help you with. Now, there's quite a few slides here. And I don't propose to talk to all of them by any means, but they should be a bit of a tool for you to take away, a bit of a roadmap. So when you come to that section of your data room, hopefully quite far in advance of actually putting it up, thinking what's going to go in there, and you work through your IP assets, identifying them, and make sure your company owns them. So, next, next slide. So, how do you identify your IP asset? So I find it helps to divide them into your asset, which is the physical work. Um, for example, we've got here software, algorithms, branding. Um, for example, in AI, you have output data, you have input data, you have training data, um, various permutations of data which you will have manifested in some Form. You might have it collected in a spreadsheet or in a database, or, or you may have the data recorded on paper. But either way, it is an asset. Um, you'll have a brand. I just talked about that. It might not be registered, but you will have branding, logos, style guides, the look and feel of your website. That's all an asset. It's all intellectual property. Um, so having identified those assets, you then have to work out what protects those assets. What rights are we looking at? And roughly divided into four. So you've got rights that occur automatically. Um, for example, the obvious one, copyright. So as soon as you create a copyright work, it is protected. You don't have to do anything, you don't have to register anything, it is protected. Now, there may be housekeeping things you should do 
for example, to evidence that, in fact, it was you who created it and when you created it. But that said, the right itself, it occurs automatically. Other rights need registration. Um, prime examples are, of course, patents. You have to apply for a patent and you have to evidence certain points in order to get the patent. So that's a registrable right. Then you have common law rights, um, which are governed by common law. They're not statute based. And you have contractual rights, which are not so much intellectual property rights, but they are rights you have as a result of a contract you've entered into. So we'll have a little look at all of these categories. So, starting with rights that occur automatically. So these are three of the most common examples of these kinds of rights, and I'm going to just talk about copyright today, given the time constraints. Um, so, looking at your copyright assets, what have you got? Well, anything you've written will probably have copyright attached to it. And if what you have written is important to your company, then it is worth making sure you have a clear note of who wrote those. Um, if it's the specifications or whether it's your computer code, um, whether it's database structures or anything like that. In fact, even if it's video recording, maybe you have a, a whole set of training videos, maybe you're a training company. So make sure you have a record of all these assets that you've created that will be protected by copyright. And make sure you have a clear note of when they were created, the date the copyright occurred. As far as the software asset is concerned, so when you're actually creating um, computer code, um, watch out. I, I put a pitfall here. I try and put pitfalls throughout things to watch out for. But most assets will have some peculiar pitfall associated with them. Um, but as far as software code is concerned, of course, open source code. Now, using open source in code in your development is great. It, it, it's not a bad thing. Most people do use open source in their development. But do not think that that's because they're open source, that means they're available to the public without license. There will be a license, and somewhere behind that source code you'll have, um, it might even be a couple of lines, but that will be your permission to use it. And depending on what that permission says, how permissive it is, you need to make a record of it. So for whenever you use open source code, you need to have, I would suggest, some good housekeeping in place. You have a record of what the code is and what license associates with it. And um, I'll mention it again later on when we come to licensing, but just be aware of it. Good housekeeping keeping with open source. Um, right, now we'll look at registered rights. So, that example here, of course, is patent rights. Um, now, as I say, what's the asset? Well, it's an idea to begin with. And if the idea can run through enough hurdles so that you can explain it on paper and you can tick the boxes of novel, innovative, capable of industrial application, then you are well on your way to your application. Um, the right, of course, is, gives you an exclusive right to prevent other manufacturing goods um, based on your invention. Now, thing to watch out for with patent rights, particularly in our techie world, is uh, the exclusions to the categories of um, what you can patent. Um, classic exclusion is, of course, uh, mathematical formulae. Um, Anything that can be done as a, by the mind, for example, um, which is, you know, if it's being sped up by a computer program, for example, these things cannot be patented. And so AI can sometimes cause a problem because there are some great innovations in the AI world at the moment. And you think, oh, I might have something patentable there. But actually, you will probably in the first instance fall within the excluded matter. And then you have to create something or you have to find a way of drafting your patent application so that you can show what's known as technical effect. Now, that's got to be something over and above what that program does or your AI does has to affect something outside of that. So it has to be part of a bigger system, really. And that's all I'm going to say on, on, on patents. I'm not a patent attorney. And generally, if you are going to look for a patent application, um, seek a patent application, you'd want to speak to a patent attorney. Um, and that is courses for courses. Not every patent attorney will be right for you. They have real subject specialism. Um, registered trademarks, of course, we just spoke about. Um, you have a brand, I would recommend early, early on getting your brand sorted out. Um, you don't want to be rebranding when you're going around to your investment rounds. That's the last thing you want to be doing. Or indeed, once you've already invested time, effort and money promoting yourself, selling yourself to the market and then find, oh gosh, we didn't do enough searching at the beginning. We're going to have to stop using this brand because somebody is about to sue us. Um, 
or we can't grow beyond the UK because the brand is used elsewhere by another company in, for example, Europe or America. Um, and then you have to put a lot of effort into rebranding, which is costly and a waste of time. Um, so not something you want to do. So get your searches done early on. Now you can do these yourself to begin with. They could be a bit rough and ready, but it will give you an idea. So you go to the UK IPO, UK Intellectual Property Office, and you can do your own trademark searching there to see whether what you have in mind is available. Looking for a word mark. Um, a lot of us have our designs and our brands, but the, the, your name as a word is the, the widest protection you can get when you register it. Um, when you have a brand, a logo, the protection is a little bit narrower. So go in the first instance for your name. Um, and then, of course, when you choose your name, you don't want anything too descriptive. Um, because if it's descriptive, it won't be distinctive of your goods, and therefore you won't get trademark registration. So watch out and think about all these things early on. Definitely um, important, important one to get your branding right. However, if you can't get it right, or, or, or didn't manage to early stage, all is not lost. So we have common law rights. So if you haven't managed to get a trademark registration, which gives you protection for the moment it's registered, um, you can get protection at common law. Um, so if you have a, a descriptive brand, perhaps, that you find, oh, damn, you can get it through. But if you've been using it in the marketplace and you can show that you, over time, have built up goodwill in that brand, even though it's not registered, you still can rely on the laws of passing off to prevent others using that brand. So it's worth knowing. Um, and so if ever you are using a brand in the marketplace in the early stages and you get good customer feedback, keep that feedback, keep that thing, because that becomes evidence of recognition in the marketplace. And you might want to use that when establishing um, a passing off action if you would need to stop somebody else using your brand. Or indeed, if somebody has approached you and um, you know, if they're looking for a registration themselves and you want to stop them getting that registration. That was your evidence to show we were here first and we have market recognition. Um, I'll have a quick word. I know we're short of time. I'll have a quick word on laws of confidence. Um, just because you haven't got an NDA doesn't mean to say that you're not protected. Um, but by far, is the best, by far, good housekeeping is have an NDA because it is evidence that you impose an obligation of confidence on whoever you're disclosing information to. So if you're protecting an idea, for example, that hasn't yet worked its way through the patent system, or if you don't have any other means of protecting any uh, you, your intellectual property, so it may be absolute know-how that you possess. In that case, it's your trade secret. Always use an NDA. Make sure you contractually set it out in writing just to evidence that you've imposed that obligation of confidence. Now, zooming on ahead, um, I'm moving to try and try work out where we're on the slide. So, having identified all your assets, then you meant to make sure they are secured to your company. Are you vested in the company that the investors are going to invest in? Um, because otherwise they will ask you to have put them there if you haven't already done so. So, you don't want to be going to consultants um, and other third parties at a time of investment round, tap in hand saying, dear, we should have invested, we should have had this in the company, we didn't get the paperwork, can you do it now? Because they will actually probably ask a lot more if they know you're under the cost and have a deadline than they would early stage when you both got a much stronger negotiating position. So make sure you have employee agreements in place to make, to, to, to make it clear, to make it clear that you, um, they are employees, you consider them employees, and they will be the first owners of your um, firm. They'll be the first owners of your, of, the company will be the first owners of the IP. If you're using freelancers and you're all working um, as contractors, make sure you have agreements with an assignment in them. Otherwise, you'll be in a position I mentioned before, having to go seeking an assignment of IPR. And finally, that's that consultants. And finally, third party IPR. Make sure you have paperwork to show all the licensing that you do. We've talked briefly about um, open source licensing, and as I said, make sure you have good, good housekeeping in respect to open source licensing, particularly looking for the viral effect of open source licenses like what we call the GNU, the general public license, and the lesser GNU. Um, you can still use those, just make sure that the development team are doing the right things to make sure that the underlying license doesn't affect your commercial development because it can if you're not careful. And I think that's all from me. I'll leave it there. Um, so now I'm going to pass to my colleague, Alex Lloyd, who's going to talk to you about investment term sheets. Over to Alex. 
Hi everyone, I'm Alex Lloyd. I'm a senior associate in the corporate team at Burgess Salmon. I know we're running already running over a little bit. I can see Nick nodding and looking disapprovingly at me, so I'll be quick. Investment term sheets is the broad topic. Two points that you, they're investor protections, they go to value and they're often misunderstood. So that's why we've chosen, I've chosen to look at liquidation preferences and anti-dilution ratios. Before I go on though, there's a really useful um, publication that's put out by the BVCA. They put out a sort of template term sheet, BVCA being the British Venture Capital Association. They put out a, a template term sheet and alongside that is a guide to investment term sheets. So I'd advise that you go on their website and have a look at that for a sort of general overview of term sheets and the provisions that are in them. We're going to, I'm going to talk to a little scenario um, to illustrate what I'm saying. So this is the scenario in front of us here. You've got some founders in the top row. They've got 100 ordinary shares, which they paid £100 when the company was set up. The investor and the founders have then agreed that the company's worth £200,000 on a pre-money valuation. So you've got those 100 shares. 200 grand divided by 100 shares gives you a per share valuation of £2,000. That investor is agreed to invest 200,000 and in exchange for that at two grand a share they're getting 100 A shares and this table also includes an option pool which we can ignore for the purposes of this but suffice to say if we were looking at the fully diluted post money valuation of this business on this scenario post money means following the round and including the proceeds of the round fully diluted means including the shares and also including anything else that could become shares in this case it's employee options but it could be warrants or convertible loans whatever else. So first off, we're looking at liquidation preferences and the effect of a liquidation preference. Liquidation preference just being the right for, an, for the investor to get out what it put in or a multiple of what it put in ahead of any other shareholder on a liquidity event. And when we talk about a liquidity event, don't think of it as just a winding up or a liquidation. Could, it's, we're talking about any situation where capital is returned to shareholders, so it could be a sale. So a good way of thinking of, a, say, take this, the third column and the fourth column in that table. When I'm talking about a 200k liquidity event, think of it as a sale which has generated 200,000 pounds of, of proceeds to be distributed between the shareholders. So let's look at it first of all without a liquidation preference. So as we said before, the founders have 100 ordinary shares and the investor has 100 A shares, 50-50 equity split. So with no liquidation preference, you have a £200,000 liquidity event and it's split 50-50, 100,000 each. If it were a million pound liquidity event, £500,000 each, straightforward. Next, if we look at what would happen if there was a one times liquidation preference, so the investor has the right to get its money out, its £200,000 investment out before anyone else receives any proceeds. So in your, on your £200,000 liquidity event, you've got 200000 to go around. The first 200000 slice goes to the investor. That's what the liquidation preference does, and it leaves nothing for the founders. So on your £200,000 liquidity event with a one-time liquidation preference, all proceeds go into the investor and gives them downside protection. The same if, if it were a million-pound liquidity event um, with a one-time liquidation preference. First 200,000 would go to the investor. That leaves 800,000 to be split between the founders and the investor. So the investor gets its 200,000 and then half of that 800,000, leaving it with 600. Um, founders left with 400. If, and then next we run the scenario of a two times liquidation preference. So the situation on the 200,000 pound liquidity event is the same as on the one times, all the money goes to the investor. We take the one million pound liquidity event. So the investor is getting twice its, its investment back first. So it's taking the first 400,000, leaves 300,000 to be split between the founders and the investors 50 50. The end result is 700,000 to the investor, 300,000 to the founders. Now, the, the takeaway and the, the key point really on this slide is that you as founders might want to be saying, well, hang on. The purpose of this liquidation preference is really a downside protection for the investor. So what I want as a founder is a catch-up right. So if we now run through 
how that catch up rate would work in a, in a million pound liquidity event. So let's imagine, imagine it's a sale. We've got a sale scenario. There's a million pounds to go around. We, we're going we're gonna to look here at the two times um, liquidation preference. So the investor gets the first £400,000, twice its original £200,000 investment first. But then the catch up rate, if, if it's been negotiated and applies, will kick in. The next £400,000 goes to the founders to catch up with that liquidation preference. So at that point, £800,000 has been distributed, 400 to the founders, 400 to the investor, leaving 200 to be split 50 50. And the end result is £500,000 each. And so, so what you're doing by applying this catch up right is saying in an upside scenario, we don't want the liquidation preference skewing the, skewing the proceeds, screwing the allocation of the proceeds. In a downside scenario, we realize you investors want some downside protection, and we recognize that, yes, you should get your investment or multiple of your investment out first. But in an upside scenario, we've created value for everybody involved, and so we'd like to be treated with parity, please. So that's your takeaway on the liquidation preferences. Next, and I'll be quick, Nick. Next, we're talking about anti-dilution protections. So there's three main ones. That we, we will talk about the most obvious one and the one that's included in nearly all articles is just a simple preemption right. So um, if the investor wants to stop itself from being diluted, it has a right to subscribe pro rata for any new shares that are issued. In effect, it follows its money. If you want to stay, keep your, keep your ownership percentage, invest in this follow, follow on round. The, the third bullet on there is the most blunt of all protections, which is just giving the investor a pure veto right over any equity raise. If you know you're going to be raising future money, it's perhaps a difficult thing for a, to, to swallow to swallow for our founders. The second one is the one we're going to talk about in the next slide, and this is where you apply a formula, a ratchet, to offset the dilutive effect of a down round. And I'm going to very quickly run through this table, which demonstrates what happens with a full ratchet in play. So our original investor, remember, invested £200,000 at £2,000 per share for 100 A shares. In this scenario, things have gone wrong, that the valuation of the company has dropped and we've got a down round investor coming in. And that down round investor is investing the same amount of money, 200,000, but it, that investor is doing so at 1,000 pounds per share. So half the, half the price, double the shares. No ratchet at all. You'd end up with a down round investor holding 50% of the shares, the seed investor and the founders both holding 25%. If you had a full ratchet, um, and I won't go into detail as to how the ratchet would work exactly, but it would either be a bonus issue of shares to the to the seed investor, or it would be an adjustment to the conversion ratio that applies to the seed investor shares. We won't get into that for now. But uh, assuming there's a full ratchet in place, seed investor is treated as if it had, it had invested at the £1,000 per share rather than the £2,000 per share value. It, it's left with parity with the down round investor. So they each get 40% of the business. And it's the founders that suffer a significant dilution in the, in the full ratchet. The reason I've said that is to, is to leave you with a takeaway, which is there are three formulas that could apply here. There's this full ratchet, which is the one founders want to avoid. There's a narrow based weighted average, and there's a broad based weighted average. It's a broad based weighted average and dilution protection that founders should push for, and it's the one you most commonly see. I think that's me done. It was a bit rapid, but any questions, please shoot them through to me on the email or on the Q&A. And I'll hand over now to Fliss, who is a director and co-founder of Ordo. She's actually done this from the founder side, so it'll be good to hear her insights. Thanks very much, Alex. And thanks to Alex and Sarah, who did help us on our investment round. So, yes, um, I'm one of four other co-founders of Ordo, and I have a confession to make. I am doing this presentation in my slippers. <laughs> so there are five of us that founded Ordo all together, and we also actually worked together in our previous lives at a company called Fast Payments, which is the collaborative central company, not-for-profit, that runs all online and mobile payments in the UK. And I mention this because this gives us um, Two of the, well, three out of three of key things that investors will be looking for. And my takeaways are going to be to evidence and demonstrate 
to investors that you can do the job that they want you to do. And so three of those things tap into Monica's first T in team. And that is we have a balance of skills. So we had a cross section of the skills that we needed to run our payment service, our request for payment service that Audio is. We were an experienced team together. So we know about the good, the bad and the ugly about each other. And we proved that we could work together. And having come from that related environment, we proved that we knew about the sector we were in, that we knew about payments and that we knew about banking and where to go from there. So that was our history, I suppose. And as part of that history, um, there were rumblings in the industry a few years ago about payments is pretty good in the UK, but what about if it could be brilliant for most people most of the time? It could be better than it is quite good for most people most of the time. And what came out of those discussions was a service, something called a request for payment service, which is solving the gaps that we have in the UK payments market at the moment, which is that payments, invoicing for payment, asking for payment, it can be disjointed. People can feel a bit awkward about asking for payment at times. We have the onslaught of fraud, which is only growing, which was 455 million in 2019 alone of invoice email interception fraud. And then there are people that don't have lives that match the monthly regular direct debit that so many of us have now. And that affects people that have irregular incomes and low incomes. It's a whole swathe of people which is only going to increase to get more and more of the economy. So a request for payment service that joined up all of that from the incurring of goods and services, a biller and business needing to send out their invoice securely, knowing it wouldn't be hacked and intercepted, allowing their customer a way to pay their bills without really having to think about it, without waiting for this paper bill to come through the post, remember the reference, remember the amount, remember to actually make the payment at the end of the day when you've already done your day's work and you're pretty tired. It was this request for payment service that became the, this is possibly the solution to plug a gap in our very advanced payment service. And so when my co-founders and I were at Faster Payments, we said, well, we need to test that for it to work for anyone to invest in this. So we commissioned two reports. One was by Accenture to determine whether there was a business model, a business case for this. And secondly, a customer user experience, which was a company called Eclipse went out and with mocked up phone screens to people on the street to say, if this kind of flexible, keep control of your finance, service were available, would you use it? And happily, the answer from both Accenture, is there a business case, and the customer experience people, would you use this, was yes. So that then gives you your next layer of things that investors will want to see and see evidence and see demonstrated, which is, what is the need? What's the problem you've identified? And what's your solution for this? illustrating the problem, illustrating what you can do for that. And so those reports helped us and helped build a case for then convincing investors that we're the people to invest in for this. And so then we looked at setting up partnerships. And so we made the decision rather than have lots of different suppliers and cutting and um, choosing different ones and mi mixing and matching with who we go with, we would work very closely with hand-picked few companies. And so, for example, uh, that applied to our platform provider. Our platform provider who, who has built our platform for us is CGI, who are a global systems integrator, has that reputation for building robust and resilient services, and is known in the payments and finance and banking sector. So again, this would be more evidence. It would be more evidence that we as co-founders have made the right judgment, that we're aware of what the companies are in this sector, who's got a good reputation, who is able to provide the service we need from them. And a question we get asked a lot is, so what do you do when you scale? Can this ramp up? Can you do big volumes? And our answer to that is yes, because we built for that from the very beginning. And there's another reason why we went with a company like CGI and we've had, we've had other partnerships set up along the way and, and that's because they stand to win from this too and that's my next big point which is to start working with people that you can have a strategic goal with that their win is your win and vice versa because then you create a win-win situation 
and both parties are incentivized to work with each other and really make a success of it rather than just the supplier and the customer and the customer pays and the supplier supplier supplies relationship if both parties can get something out of this then it's win-win for both parties and both parties are incentivized and then i come on to um our we had in order we had initial founder and seed investment back in uh april may and august um 2018 which was when we started and then we needed to start scaling up and building more. And so we had investment from Nationwide Building Society, their ventures team. Nationwide decided that they wanted to invest in certain companies that would be the future and provide future services for their members. And so they set aside a pot of 50 million and went out to look for fintechs that were building and providing services that their members would be able to benefit from too. And so our values and our goals perfectly aligned with that nationwide. Their brand is known for helping ordinary people on the street, helping people save, helping people pay for their mortgages, helping keep people keep feeling on top of their finances and like they can manage things that are going on. And that is exactly what Ordo is there to do. We can make we make getting paid easy. We make it instant so that businesses aren't waiting for their money. We make move the money instantly so people know exactly where they are. They know that they've spent 20 quid last Friday night in the days when we were allowed to go out and have a drink after work. Instead of waiting for that to be deducted from your debit card, and by the time that happens, you've forgotten you've spent that, so you've actually spent it again. All of these things, they're very mundane, they're very ordinary, but they help with just the everyday part of your everyday managing finances. And so our goals and our values aligned, and that's why it's a perfect partnership between Ordo and Nationwide. We, from our um, previous lives and faster payments, we did know certain people in all the banks throughout that used to that participate in the faster payment scheme. So we did know people in these participants, and so we knew people at Nationwide, and that we did have uh, an internal sponsor which helped us get through the venture meetings and the rounds of questions and so on. I completely agree with everything that Sarah and Monica and Alex have said. It's all about preparation and evidence. Things like paperwork, which if you're trying to run a business like Monica highlights, you have to do all the time, can feel quite, um, this should be on the sidelines, it's quite frustrating to have to produce all your board minutes and all your director appointments. But they're, they're what the investor wants to see. So just make your life easier, make their life easy, and get your paperwork up in a day to room early. There are other quick wins, easy little wins that you can celebrate along the way. Because make no mistake about it, running your own business is hard. And we launched in lockdown, so this is super hard. So you need to celebrate the wins along the way because that's what keeps you going. And actually, that's the evidence and the demonstration to your investors that they'll want to see that you are the right ones to be running this business and you're the right ones for them to invest into. So get all your board minutes done and uploaded into a data room, do even a summary and a, a signposting of what you decided and when. There are things like, for Monica mentioned, the SEIS and EIS schemes, you can apply to HMRC to get that advanced assurance in advance. So that's another that's another asset you can say to investors, we already have this, we've done it. And all of these things together also demonstrate that you're on top of the business and you know what you're doing and you make the right judgment calls and you know what's good for your business and you've done that already in advance. So those would be my um, messages to you. Um, strategic partners. Find people that align with your business and your goals. And we're always on the lookout for more partners and more people to work with. So if you're interested, get in touch. <laughs> and celebrate the little wins along the way. Because that's what will keep you going. And that's what your investors will want to see too. So Brilliant. I'll hand back over to Nick. Brilliant. Thank you, Fliss. That was really insightful. And thank you, uh, Sarah, Monica, and, and Alex for your uh, input. So um, we uh, are, are tight on time now. Um, and uh, just to kind of throw in a, a question for me, first of all, just picking up on 
on Fliss's point there, which I thought was really nicely um, described, Fliss, you, you made the point about finding an investor w with, which was strategic and you had a com common goal, um, which, which makes perfect sense. So kind of question to everybody, if, if, if you can, um, if, if I was to kind of be a little bit broad brush for a moment, finding a, a strategic investor with a common goal, the commercial and the mission and the financial return is, is kind of all aligned. If you've got an investor who's purely looking for their financial return with the company with an emission, with a mission to deliver, and there may be some tensions there. So are we seeing, you know, traditionally the, the, the kind of the, the, the mantra has always been about it's just making return on investment. And with an increase in perhaps purpose, more purpose-driven businesses, how, is there a change in sentiment in the investment community that, that reflects that? Or how do you align those things? Perhaps Monica, do you have a view? Yeah, happy, happy to take that one. Um, especially within the fintech sector, there's a large move to to seeing corporate VCs, which is the likes of Nationwide and some of the bigger banks, um, really moving into investing in tech companies, whether that's uh, and a strategic investment or an actual full-on acquisition. And that's mainly because they have a number of pain points. I mean, they are kind of coming through as, um, you know, slower banks with all these fintechs running around, really, you know, these younger, agile companies that are just doing great things. And because they want to bring that capability in-house, um, there is a lot of there is just a lot of activity in that in that sector, especially in that sector. There's obviously other things going on within health and you know mm -hmm. the other sectors, but especially within fintech, banks are particularly interested in, in investing in fintechs and aligning with fintechs and being able to leverage some of their capability and bringing that in house. So there is a lot of that. It's true. So so it's perhaps important for for founders or, or CEOs. Um, to be clear and, and strong about their mission and purpose and, and have the confidence that Absolutely. there are investors who will align with that potentially. Absolutely. I mean, as you have discussions with your advisors, you will, you will flesh out, you really have dis deep discussions around what problem you're trying to solve and who are you trying to solve this problem for, right? Who is going to benefit the most? And you'll find, you know, especially within FinTech, again, back to that sector, um, you know, you, you're usually solving a problem that maybe a bank is also seeing as a problem. And so, you know, they see the benefit of investing in you so that they can, you know, they can get that benefit as well. So as you pitch, as you think about pitching to investors, you want to know that, you know, if you go and have a chat with the VC about yes. what problem you're trying to solve, they may not value it the same way as the bank will value it. So it might be of greater value to a bank. And that sure. can translate into, you know, a high valuation, better terms in a term sheet. It's yep. Yep. You have to think about where you get the most value from. And within FinTech, definitely banking um, and corporate VC sure. big players. Sure. Yeah. Cool. No, that, that, that's useful. Thanks. Okay, so John um, Gowdy is coming with a question. Um, are there any comments on uh, having multiple investors per round? Uh, it might um, raise more complications, but um, I, are, are there any advantages? Alex, have you got a comment on that? I, I can answer that, Nick. It, it, it depends on the situation, but in, in an ideal world, you want a lead investor that's going to be, you don't want to be, as a company, negotiating with six, seven, eight, different investors at the same time. It makes my life incredibly hard for a start. <laughs> but it's a lot of um, noise on the I think you'd want ideally to be negotiating with one advisor for a single investor. The other issue that happens is sometimes you get investors with very different priorities and backgrounds. So say you have pay investors coming in um, and they wanting to take advantage of the EIS or SEIS scheme on the one hand and you may have some American investors coming in on the other side who are used to invest in US documents and want all sorts of protections and, 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 and things in the, in the term sheet and in the documentation which are incompatible with EIS. So you could end up with having UK guys unable to ask for the things that the US investors are asking for and there's an obvious disconnect there. So in, in an ideal world, you've got a group of investors with one lead investor and they have um, aligned strategic goals. Um, it's not always possible, of course. Okay, thanks, Alex. I'm, I'm so very conscious we're going to have to kind of wrap up now, which is which is a shame because there's lots of areas we could explore here, but um, time has has got the better of us. Contact details for all our um, uh, speakers are up on the screen for you to screen grab. Um, uh, so it's just it's for me really to thank you all for joining us. Um, some really interesting points coming out there, um, and, and of course, Fliss covered a lot of those nice succinctly 
um, at, at the end. But for me, get your planning right, get the right advisor or set of advisors. And of course, you know, advisors aren't a commodity. You have to get the right fit for you and your and your business because you're going to need to work a lot of blood, sweat, and tears with your advisors um, to get through the process to make sure you've got you've got the right fit. Um, uh, and I was particularly interested in in Sarah's point that I hadn't clocked about um, if you aren't able to register your trademark or you haven't um, uh, your brand brand assets getting recording customer feedback to demonstrate your traction in the market. That was a, a nice little snippet. So thank you all. Uh, the next event uh, coming up is 23rd of September. The details are on the screen uh, there. Uh, details to follow. Thank you all for joining. I hope it's been useful. And the last little thing is to say that as you exit the event, uh, you will see a survey. We really value your feedback and ideas for future events. So enjoy the rest of the day. I hope it's productive and good luck with your investment raising. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.